So I'm going to give you guys some, some background for our lab today. So we're going to start talking about one of our resource management challenges in a new context. And so in this case, this is going to be um, a place that we haven't, uh, we don't have a huge amount of experience with. It's relatively new. It is the, um, the depths of the ocean. So remind me from our lecture on Friday, what's the average depth of the world's ocean? Yeah, yeah, I didn't hear it. Three what? More like 3.7, 3.8. So not quite four, right? So deep. It's much of the planet is deep. The one thing we haven't talked about much is the notion of, so we talked about, you know, the, the salt and properties of the water, et cetera. One of the things, not only is it deep, but with that depth comes pressure. So right now, you and I are experiencing the pressure at the surface of the Earth. So you and I are feeling, essentially, the squeezing down of all the air that's above us. Gravity is pulling that air down and, and containing it around us. And so that, those air molecules, the temperature of the air, et cetera, is squeezing against my forearm here. And do you guys know how much pressure it's, it's squeezing on my, on my forearm? 14, right, okay. Right, if we want to use atmosphere, it's one atmosphere worth of pressure. Um, about 14.2 pounds per square inch if you want to use the old PSI stuff. The point is, right here, my forearm, it's squeezing down. On this other side of my arm, it's squeezing this way. On this way, it's squeezing this way, et cetera. And my arm is essentially, and my, my muscles and everything else are essentially squeezing back with essentially that same amount of pressure. In my lungs right now, if I'm not, if I hold my breath, the pressure inside my lung right there is equal to the pressure in the air outside, right? So my lungs don't collapse, my lungs don't pop out, right? They're, they're in a stasis with this pressure. And how high is our, how far up does our atmosphere go? You guys know? Different definitions, depends on how we, how, whose definition we're using, but we're about roughly 100 miles or so of air above us. It gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and eventually just becomes space. But, but you know, many miles. So 100 miles worth of air equals, as Melvin or whoever said that, one atmosphere worth of pressure. How far into the water, into the seawater, do we need to go to get another atmosphere worth of pressure? Do you guys know? 20 what? <laughs> 10 meters. 10 meters, so about 33 feet, one, or, uh, 10 meters or 33 feet, roughly, equals another atmosphere worth of pressure. If we go another 10 meters in, that's another atmosphere worth of pressure. Another 10 meters, another atmosphere worth of pressure, right? And so if we have a balloon, if we take this balloon right here, and this is, so right now this balloon we blew up with my lungs, right, with the air here at sea level. And just like my lungs, this balloon is the, the pressure inside is equal to the pressure outside because it's maintaining this, this balloon, this circular shape, right? If we take this thing, now it's sealed, so I have a, it's capped, right? So the air can't go in or out. It's, it's what it is right now. If we jump in the water, if you and I jump in the water, and we swim this down, 10 meters down, the diameter of this balloon, of this, of this sphere, will be half. Because the pressure will have doubled, right? At 10 meters down, it's going to be two atmospheres worth of pressure. So it's twice as squeezing in. Does that make sense? If we go down another atmosphere, it'll be one third the size that it was at, at the surface, and so and so forth. Make sense? So the point is, Going down into the ocean, pressure is a huge thing, a huge challenge. And that's actually the biggest challenge um, that will play out in a second when we talk about um, going, going deeper into the world's oceans. Um, yeah. Okay. So we're going to start with the Cold War. So we're going to start with what was um, an active deception. This, I mean, some people say we're now in another Cold War. Maybe it's a hot war. Who, who the heck knows? But in the time this was, the U.S. and the Western powers, NATO, 
versus what we then call the Soviet Union, right? And a lot of this was an existential threat. A lot of this, people on both sides thought that the world was going to end, that their way of life was going to end, and this other, this enemy, this different person, right? Sound familiar? Is going to somehow hurt us and destroy stuff. So one of the ways that manifested was a huge military uh, race and technology race. So everybody's trying to build stuff. Now, submarines, underwater going vessels, first come onto the scene around World War I, but they're very not very sophisticated, actually before then, but, but really get going around World War I, really take off in World War II. World War II ends, and, we, and now everybody's, oh my god, let's, let's make nuclear weapons. So nuclear submarines are part of the, the nuclear trident. So one was nuclear weapons on land, one was nuclear weapons on airplanes that could, bombers that could take off and launch, and then um, perhaps the most important were the submarines, because these guys could, could move anywhere and the idea was be hidden, right? So this was part of this totally insane effort to try to destroy our planet every which way we could with a thousand gazillion million nuclear weapons, way more than you would ever need, right? And the, and the philosophy was called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, so that, so that things were getting so terrifying that the world would end if anybody flinched kind of thing. And so that would therefore, so goes the theory, deter people from using nuclear weapons. So, so as a consequence, lots of money was going into submarines. Lots of money was going into subsea technologies. Because this was a new thing, as we all know, new research, new technology stuff oftentimes doesn't work. And usually it doesn't work for a while until it fully works. So for example, various submarines would malfunction and not work and be lost at sea or somehow otherwise damaged. Um, in 1968, we lost four submarines, including um, the USS Scorpion. The Soviets lose, and this is important for today's story, this submarine called K-129. It sinks. Now, back then, the US had the technology advantage in things like listening. So not only we had these submarines that were going places, we also were trying to figure out where the other people's submarines were. So through a whole series of technologies, including these, these sonar networks and these listening stations around the world's oceans with the intent of tracking surface and subsurface vessels across the planet. Our network was, much, was more sophisticated than the Soviet's network. So when this thing happens, when, this, when the Soviet submarine goes underwater, and, and goes out and maneuvers in the Pacific Ocean, it disappears. The Soviets don't know where it is. They don't have a way to track it. They didn't know exactly where it was. Again, part of the goal here is to be quiet and to be hidden and stuff. We actually knew what was going on. The Soviets didn't. We knew where it was. The Soviets did not. And so pretty quickly, the Americans realize as the Soviets go out and start sending out rescue craft, it ain't, it, they're in the wrong spot. So they think it's somewhere where it is not. Along with this is the relatively limited technology of the 1960s. We don't have a submarine that can go as deep as we can go now. Now having said this, this is an interesting side note here. We have the bath escape, the, the Trieste, we went to, before this, we went to the deepest point in the ocean, the Challenger depth, part of the Marianas Trench. You guys remember how deep that was? The deepest point of the deep ocean? Look back in your notes. Somebody impressed me. 10,000 meters? Uh, 11,000. So, so 11 kilometers. 11 kilometers down is the Challenger deep. So the Marianas Trench, as a trench, as a, as a rift, is, is the deepest area of the ocean and the deepest part of the deep is called the Challenger Deep. We actually sent two people down um, uh, to that, brought them up. As they're going down, they heard bang, 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 bang. Hmm, what was that? I guess we should keep going down. Right? Luckily, their, their spherical container, which is literally a sphere that was bolted closed, went down, they looked out the window for a little bit, saw there were fish down there. Oh my God, life does exist down deep. And then they went back up. Until that time, no human has ever been 
to the bottom of the ocean again until James Cameron went a couple years ago because he's James Cameron and he likes the bottom of the ocean. He likes to make movies. So he made a robot and he went down in like a one person sort of robot suit. So only three people have been to the deepest part of the ocean. So even though we had the technology in theory to go down deep, it is still incredibly hard. And you know, notoriously, the Japanese, some of our most, one of our most technologically sophisticated societies, was trying for years and years to go to the bottom. And they kept taking these robots, and they'd almost get down, and bzzz, wires would short out, pressure would crush something on their device, and it would never make it. So going down deep is hard. In 1968, routinely going down deep is still very difficult. So we, we figure out this thing is down, the submarine is down there, but we can't get to it. What are you going to do? So this guy is four, a little over the, a, a bit more than a kilometer deep than the average depth of the ocean, northwest of Hawaii. And this is a picture of it. This, this is, so we weren't able to get to it, but we could lower down, a, we could take a submarine down, and then from that submarine, lower down a little teeny camera and take film pictures with, with uh, strobe lights. That's what this picture is on the right. And what you're looking at is the submarine, the Russian submarine that is, in, that malfunctioned and everybody's dead and it's on the side on its side on the bottom of the ocean almost five kilometers straight down um so okay we know where it's there we know the soviets don't know it's there and of course this is like you know the, the prize for all these military dudes right we want to go get the codes we want to go get the missiles we want to figure out how they design their engines right we want this technology we want to do forensics on on how they design their systems right so what are they going to do? Now, this is the Cold War era. Let me re reiterate. There's a movie out now about going to the moon. The moon was insane. It was awesome and totally killer and all that kind of good stuff. The current estimates are something like 9% of the gross domestic product of the United States went into the space race. It's hard to explain to you how many trillions of dollars we pumped into going to space. This was an era when we actually invested in science, when people actually believed in scientists. People thought that there's power in STEM, unlike our leadership today, which thinks it's some kind of conspiracy or something like that. So, so money was not an option. This was an existential threat. So what do you do? What do you guys think? What would you guys do? Money not an option. How are you going to go get the sub? Okay, so, so you got a lot of money. What's that? Use the military. That's one option. Well, these guys decided what they'd do is use the CIA, not the military. And we'll use this dude. This is Howard Hughes. So Howard Hughes, would, you guys probably don't know who that is, but Howard Hughes is, uh, was a, a brilliant engineer, aerospace engineer. Um, uh, pilot, designed airplanes, engines, you might know from, from Hughes Aircraft, the engines that powered a lot of planes during World War II and afterwards. And this guy is the model for Tony Stark's dad. That's how you guys might know him in today's modern era, right? So this guy was an industrialist and, and we now recognize him as somebody that also had a lot of mental health issues, which ultimately uh, brought him down, unfortunately. but. Um, this is, a, this is sort of a crazy dude. So think Elon Musk, right? Kind of like an Elon Musk type dude. And so what we do is we say, hey, we need a cover story. So what can we do? So the CIA went to Howard Hughes and said, dude, can you go bring up this secret Soviet submarine from the bottom of the ocean? But we don't want to use the military. We don't want anybody to know what we're doing. Nobody knows where it is. So it has to look like we're doing something other than what we're doing. So here's a gazillion million, gazillion, I don't know, millions, billion dollars. What, do whatever you want to do. So he goes, OK, we got to go to the bottom of the ocean. What could be valuable at the bottom of the ocean? And he says, deep sea mining. To go to the bottom of the ocean, we need a bunch of infrastructure. We need a bunch of technology. So let's build this. So this, is, uh, this ship was just recently retired from our, our fleet, the NOAA fleet. But um, this was the Glomar Explorer. 
And this, uh, and this central point of the ship, this is basically a big drill ship, a big ship to lower stuff down. Ostensibly, this was to lower down mining equipment to the bottom of the ocean. In reality, it was going to lower down a sling, pick up that submarine, suck it up, and it doesn't look like a military ship, right? And it's crazy, it's crazy, the crazy industrialist dude. So I guess that's what he's doing. And the intent was to go bring this submarine back to port. That doesn't work out. The submarine, they get the straps around it. They recover some stuff. There's still a little bit of unclearness about how much they recovered. But they, get, they start bringing the submarine up, and it breaks apart. And so most of it falls back to the bottom of the ocean. But to do this, Howard Hughes said, ah, we're, we're doing deep sea mining. And all of a sudden, all these people said, deep sea mining? Well, geez, if Howard Hughes is doing it, there must be some money in it, right? Just like when Elon Musk started doing electric cars, a lot of other auto industry folks like, well, we better, hmm, we better look in this electric car thing. There may be something to that. Um, it wasn't fully, so the project ran from 68 to 74. Nobody really knew about it until these press leaks started coming out the year later. But in this, in this early phase, in the early 70s, it spurred what we call the first deep sea mining boom. These companies started spinning up to, to go see if they could also mine the bottom of the ocean. And as a side note for us, uh, some of the technology of some of the pumps and stuff to move water in the, under pressure and stuff actually end up, eventually end up in the um, Monterey Bay Aquarium in the big giant kelp tank, which at the time was the deepest kelp tank in the world. Uh, and so, so this is a cover of the, the news story that breaks and says there's actually this uh, CIA was trying to get, get this old Russian submarine. Um, as I said, this, this ship now is, is, is decommissioned, but it was reconfigured to, you, to do drilling, uh, geological exploration and stuff. So in the decades since, it was used by science in, in a variety of, uh, of places. Um, this is what Howard Hughes said they were going after. We saw, we, we discussed earlier on Friday, we discussed the notion of, bio, uh, of uh, sort of the steady state of a lot of these um, constituents in the world's ocean, right? And steady state, even though they're still being added to the ocean, they're more or less at the same concentration because of life processes, right? Because these phytoplankton are sucking out that, that calcium, turn it into calcium carbonate, and when they die, that calcium carbonate's sinking out, right? We talked about the silicaceous ooze and all that kind of stuff. Well, there's also geological processes that can bring stuff out of the water column, and that's what we're looking at here. So we're looking at these so-called polymetallic nodules. Most famously, the ones most people historically talked about are manganese or ferrous manganese nodules. What does that mean? That means the stuff you're looking at right here. So this is a, a quadrat, we're looking at a quadrat, and we're seeing sediments and mud, and these black things are the nodules. Um, Here's a shot from an ROV, same thing, these nodules. Here's a, a shot of a transect where these guys are in. All these little black flecks on the bottom of the ocean are these nodules. Here is an exceptionally large one for scale with these guys. More typically, they're fist size, half fist size, right? So they're little, the rocks, basically, on the bottom of the ocean, sitting right on top of the mud. These are not rocks that are down deep that are poking up through the mud. These are rocks that have formed on top of the sediment. They're a mix of various things, um, various metals which have commercial value, right? For manufacturing, electronics, different kinds of things. Um, we're not 100% totally clear exactly how they all form, but um, they seem to commonly be adsorbed. So this stuff is floating around the water and, they, and these, these substances um, adsorb to the surface of this discontinuity, this piece of clay, let's say, but it could also be a shark tooth or other, other thing, and then they start to precipitate out. And then once some is there, um, other stuff is more likely to follow on, and then over time we get the, the growth of these nodules, the growth of these balls of minerals. And so check it out. From the first principles, it seems to make sense, right? To normally get iron or manganese or whatever we're looking for, we gotta go dig, we gotta blow up the ground, we gotta dig into the ground, we gotta scoop up rocks, gotta chunk it out. This, the rocks are just sitting there, right? 
So in theory, we don't need to disturb the bottom of the ocean. We don't need to drill into the, into the geology. We just need to go skim it off the top, right? So it seems very attractive. Again, the problem is this stuff is down deep. So the pressure, the logistics of getting equipment down there is very, very difficult. <coughs> there are other things down deep besides just manganese nodules. So uh, most, most obvious would be um, our gas hydrates. So this is frozen natural gas. This is natural gas, just like we, I showed you guys the ice cube, right? We talked about all the little air pockets and jazz like that. Instead of air being inside, methane is inside. And so uh, this, is, this is essentially a lattice, frozen ice crystal lattice kind of stuff with um, the natural gas inside. And you can light them on fire and the rocks will, the, what appears to be a rock will just be burning. This is why we had so initially so many problems with the capping of the deep the, the deep water horizon oil spill the wellhead there as we tried to cap it some of the stuff we stuck in there a lot of methane was coming out of that actually much more methane was spilled in the deep water horizon blowout uh, than uh, a lot more a lot more gas natural gas methane was released than oil per se and so a lot of it was these hydrates and these these this think of think of it like a slushy like a 7-eleven slushy kind of this frozen lattice of, of semi-slushy stuff, that was getting in the way of the plugs we were trying to put in initially when we were trying to plug the, the hole in the pipe. Anyway, there's methanes. There's methane down there. So there's natural gas that we could, in theory, mine by picking up. So there's, there's minerals down there. There's, there's energy resources down there. So there's a lot of reasons why people um, have sort of been interested in exploiting the bottom of the ocean for some time. That was then. We couldn't do it. So even though in the wake of Hughes's expedition to go get this dead submarine, um, these, I mentioned these companies spun up, nobody actually did anything for real. They were, all, they were formed, they started to design stuff and this and that, and then very quickly people realized there was no way they could do it economically. We could definitely go down and get some samples for you and me, for the nerdy scientists. Right? For the museum we can go get some samples. But to do something in an economically, you know, in a production manner that made sense fiscally, it was, became very clear that wasn't happening. So this first way, the first boom, all this investment in these deep sea mining companies, nothing came of it. And basically stuff went, went on pause for a few decades. The pause button has been released. Now, with the technology that we have next door in our, in our tech lab, and well, not that technology, but, 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 but sister technology, you can go down really, really deep. We can use robots to do a lot of this stuff, and we can do it in a way that makes sense, at least, at least theoretically, penciling it out, makes sense economically. And, um, and so what we're looking at here is some of that new thinking. So it's smaller scale. Is there any right now is what you're asking? Yeah, could there ever be So this is what exists right now. So this is Solara 1. So Solara 1 is off of uh, Papua New Guinea. It's, it's recently had some problems in the last little bit here, but this was, um, this is looking in the South Pacific, right? A little bit north of Australia. And what we're looking at are leased lands and, and, and initial exploitations. So as with any lease, be it oil, gold, on land or in the water, how that works is the entity that controls it, typically the, the government, the federal government, uh, this is our territory and this is our stuff. You, the exploiter, the miner, says, hey, I think there might be something valuable there. And so I, the government, might give you an exploratory permit. You don't get to go mine everywhere, but you get to go do some testing. In this case, it, it would be involved sending down ROVs and looking at the bottom. If it was oil, if it was stuff down in the strata, it would mean setting off loud explosions and you would monitor the, the movement of that sound wave through the rock and you'd try to guess if there was oil and gas down in there. So you can do some explo exploration. Once you do some exploration, you come back and you go, ah, 
Okay, and, the and then I, the government, say, says, hey, you guys have had a chance to check it out. Uh, it's, all, it's all their data, right? So it's your data. And now I'm going to have a bid, an auction. So here's my chunk of land or my territory where you can exploit. Who wants to bid on that? And so you, you guys used to physically put it into a, a sealed envelope. Now it's mostly done electronically. But so you guys submit your bid. You guys submit your bid. You guys submit your bid. Pull them together. Open them up. Who's got the high? Who's going to offer me the most money? Boom. Good. Boom. Give it to you. And now you have the right to exploit that. It doesn't mean there's any valuable resources there. But if there is, you get to take them out. And so the game that all these, these exploration efforts are about is to simply say, I think there's a ton of oil or gas or nodules or whatever it is there, and I'm going to bid for it such that I can make a lot of money if, I, if, there, if there are the resources that I think there are there and the quantities and quality that I think they are. Make sense? And so that's what's happened. Here, interesting with Solara, it, these guys aren't directly going after nodules. Other people are preparing to do that. But with this first one, these guys are using robots and they're going after this thing on the right or left. So what we're looking at here is a so-called chimney. So this is um, one of the areas in the bottom of the ocean that there's a rupture and we have geological activity down deep. It could be lava, but in this case it's not lava, it's just, it's just a crack. And so somewhere around here, somewhere around here or around here, uh, there's ocean water seeping down into the deep rocks. It's head hitting this superheated magma and different, you know, warm temperatures, interacting with the minerals and stuff like that in the strata. And then it's boiling up. And so that's what we're seeing here. So all this stuff is coming out. And this mineral rich soup of whatever the heck it is. And as it does that, just like with the nodules, some stuff is deposited. And so that's how this thing grows, right? That's like a, stalag, uh, a stalagmite. Same thing here. These are all, these are all chimneys. And so what, what the Solara project is about is about going down, sending a robot, and not picking up nodules, rather snapping off these chimneys or cutting it off with a rock saw, picking them up, throwing them in this basket, and then bringing the basket to the surface. So they're still going after minerals, but it, in this case, this first pass is not the, the nodules across the bottom of the ocean. It's going to these, these areas where we see volcanic activity or geological activity and, and sucking up the precipitates that have come out of that stuff. Cool? Make sense?